Well, Terry and Kevin, thank you both uh, very much uh, indeed. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, back here in this, uh, in this room where I've lectured many times and where the acoustics are as bad as I ever uh, remember them. Uh, so I hope that you will be able to at least uh, hear me. Uh, thank you for the rare opportunity to set out some thoughts at greater length than you ever have a chance to do in an interview or uh, even in uh, an article. Uh, and what I'm going to try to do this evening uh, are essentially three things. Um, I'm going to begin uh, by arguing that in the course of the last 30 years, uh, the United Kingdom has in some fundamental ways ceased to be a country in the European mainstream. Uh, I'm going to suggest that that uh, opening up of difference between the United Kingdom and our European Union partners has intensified in the age of austerity since 2010. And I'm going to set out some evidence which suggests uh, in a very uh, unusual way for a social scientist, uh, I'm going to suggest some evidence that in a causal way, not an associative way, but a causal way, that this departure of uh, the United Kingdom from that European mainstream and the impact of austerity, that this explains the vote to leave the European Union in June of 2016. I'm then going to move uh, in the second part of what I have to say to the bulk of what I'm going to do this evening, and that is to set out or to attempt to set out the ingredients which I believe make up a sense of Welsh 21st century socialism. Uh, and then I'm going to try and round it all back up uh, by showing briefly how such a set of political values might be applied in the Brexit context which we face here in Wales. Uh, first of all, uh, then, to that argument that I want to begin with uh, and to provide you with, I think, three pieces of evidence which I think provide the essential context for that referendum result in June of 2016. Uh, now, some of this is uh, quantitative material, so I'll try to provide the figures to you in a way that allows people to follow them, but they're, they're quite a lot of them and they can be quite difficult to uh, just listen to. So the first set of evidence comes from the OECD, uh, and it's a research report that was published exactly one year ago uh, today, published on the 1st of November 2017. Uh, and that OECD research explores the changes in the gap between the richest and poorest in a series of European and indeed uh, other non-European countries between the year 2000, uh, the year 2000 uh, and uh, the year 2015. Now, the research looks at the gap between the richest and poorest in those countries over that period. In some countries in the world, in Japan, uh, for example, the inequality gap actually narrowed in that 15-year period. The gap between the top and the bottom of uh, Japan's uh, income distribution narrowed in that 15-year period. That's very unusual uh, in the study. In the European Union itself, only Sweden shows no rise in the gap between richest and poorest. Italy and Spain have a marginal rise. Germany and France, a modest rise. The outlier in every sense is the United Kingdom. We began that period in the year 2000 with levels of inequality more than double any other country in the survey. Uh, at purchasing power parity, poorest people in the United Kingdom in the year 2000 are poorer than any other nation. In 2010, some of the poorest 10% of the population have an income on the scale 
which the OECD create, and I should um, explain this a little uh, better to you. Uh, the OECD study creates a scale, an inequality scale. In the year 2000, in the United Kingdom, the poorest 10% of the population had an income which, which gave them 60 points on the OECD scale. The top 10% of the population of the United Kingdom in the year 2000 had an annual income at 845 points on the same scale. 60 at the bottom, 845 uh, at the top. Uh, Germany is the country in the study which comes closest to the United Kingdom. Uh, at the bottom end of the scale, uh, poorest people in Germany are at around 60 points in the scale uh, as well. But the richest 10% of the German population have a score at the other end of the scale, not of 845, but just above 300. And that's the closest of any uh, country in the whole survey, including the United States. So that's in the year 2000. 15 years uh, later, and uniquely in the survey, poorest people in the United Kingdom are poorer than they were in the year 2000. And there is no other country in the survey at all where 15 years later, poor people have fallen further back than they were 10 years uh, earlier. At the top of the scale, in the United Kingdom, the richest people have moved from 845 points on the scale now to 1,150. They have broken through the 1,000 uh, barrier. Uh, in Germany, the most well-off have got richer too. They've now moved from just above 300 to just below 400. So the gap between the United Kingdom and any other country in Europe, which starts with differences in, equality, in inequality which are absolutely striking at the start of the period, that gap has grown even further uh, in uh, the 15-year period. And that's what I mean, I think, by suggesting to you that while in the European mainstream, uh, the gap between the top and the bottom in any country is relatively narrow and even under the conditions of austerity uh, grows to a modest extent. The United Kingdom begins as the most unequal country in the European Union and that accelerates away, accelerates away even faster during the austerity years. And the figures, as you will know, I'm sure, are not in any way one-off or the product of some strange methodological quirk. Uh, earlier this year, research for the Centre for, for European Reform, the Centre for European Reform, told the same story at a regional level. The United Kingdom has nine of the ten poorest regions in Northern Europe. There is one part of Belgium that is on that list. All nine others are regions of the United Kingdom. And within the United Kingdom, the gap between the richest and poorest regions is wider than in any other European Union country. And that gap, the centre uh, concludes, has widened and not narrowed during the age of austerity. Put simply, it seems to me that by the end of the period, the United Kingdom no longer looks like a European country. The mechanisms of social solidarity, which are the product of government action, have been abandoned here to an extent unparalleled elsewhere with the gross disparities exposed in the figures I've just set out. And nor, of course, in our country is this dismal journey over. On Monday, the Chancellor of the Exchequer made a set of tax changes. People earning £50,000 in Wales will be £860 a year better off as a result of those tax changes. People earning £12,000 a year, a quarter of uh, that uh, sum, will be £130 better off. And the thousands of 
families in Wales who rely on benefits which have been frozen since the year 2015 get not a single penny. The effect of that regressive budget will be to exaggerate still further the inequalities that we already experience. Now, how does all this play into the referendum of 2016? Uh, well, conscious of the setting for tonight's lecture, I come uh, with my argument fully referenced. Uh, and for this part of what I say, I rely particularly on an ESRC funded research project carried out in the Department of Economics at the University of Warwick and which reported uh, in the journals uh, earlier this year. Uh, the paper is a paper that relies mostly on uh, quantitative analysis. It traces all the electoral contests in the United Kingdom at all levels, from local uh, council elections right up to European elections. It supplements that with data from electoral panels and so on. And in surveying all those electoral contexts, it uses support for the UK Independence Party as a proxy for support for leaving the European Union. And that's not unreasonable, is it, given that this was a populist single issue party during the whole of that period. So having analysed the growth and the spatial patterns of uh, UKIP support over that period, it then analyzes spatially what the pop paper describes as austerity-induced withdrawal of the welfare state since the year 2010. So it looks at where the impact of austerity has fallen spatially, it analyzes the results in elections of all sorts in the United Kingdom, and then puts those two things together. And it concludes that exposure to austerity-induced welfare cuts was a key and causal, and causal factor in turning economic distress into political support for leaving the European Union. Or as the paper itself puts it, a decision to vote leave in the referendum is strongly and causally associated with an individual's or an area's exposure to austerity since 2010. So there's the first part of my uh, argument, that progressively over a 30-year period and to an accelerating extent uh, in the last decade, patterns of inequality in the United Kingdom have reached a point where we no longer look like other countries in the European Union, that we have not used the measures which are at the uh, behest of government that could have helped to mitigate the impacts of economic austerity in people's lives and that when you map the impact of austerity into the way that people chose to vote in the United Kingdom, you get a lineup between the two factors which explains why people voted in the way that they did where they did uh, in the referendum of 2016. I'm now going to turn to the main part of what I have to say uh, this evening, and that's an exploration of the ways in which a different approach to these fundamental issues could be created, and which I'm going to argue, if adopted, might offer a different sort of future. Uh, I've chosen deliberately uh, to call the approach one of 21st century socialism, uh, because this is a deliberate echo of a speech delivered by my friend and mentor, Rodri Morgan, over a decade ago in the run-up to the 2007 Assembly uh, elections. Uh, now that uh, speech which was uh, given in Swansea um, is less frequently cited than the clear red water speech of the first assembly term, uh, but another close friend of Rodri the great Paul Flynn uh, described the 2007 speech as Rodri's second major statement of the distinctiveness of Welsh Labour, uh, the differences between Welsh Labour and New Labour, and one which Paul said established Welsh Labour as the thinking conscience 
of the labour movement across the United Kingdom. Now, in preparing all those uh, years ago for that 2007 speech uh, in Swansea, I suggested to Rodri uh, that his title should be 21st Century Socialism, uh, a Welsh Recipe. Uh, and that was a title which, uh, unusually really, uh, he was happy uh, to use, uh, and I am happy uh, to be able to restate uh, and update those concepts for you uh, this evening. Uh, and um, both Terry and Kevin uh, referred to the fact that there is a leadership election going on inside the Labour Party at the moment. And I have been clear that my main motivation for standing as a contender in that election has been to offer a particular political choice for the Labour Party and trade union members who will have a vote in that election. And this evening, I'm going to take this opportunity to try to flesh out in a way that you don't get at hustings or in other uh, opportunities to flesh out uh, the kind of politics uh, that I mean by that. And it's a kind of politics which I believe is firmly rooted in the established principles of the radical Welsh socialist tradition uh, and which a tradition which always seems to me to be looking forwards rather than backwards and to look at the way in which bold ideas that emanate from that tradition can help us to meet our hopes and address our concerns for the future of Wales in the Brexit uh, context. Uh, and in that sense of claiming that this is a form of 21st century socialism, it is set out in the belief that our enduring principles lead us to the new policies which we need today and which we will need even more uh, tomorrow. I'm going to begin in this part by setting out what I believe to be five formative principles uh, of socialism and to say something of how I think they can be reapplied in the circumstances we face uh, today. And the most obvious place uh, to start is with the contention that if you are a socialist, then you begin from the basis that government remains when government does its job properly, uh, the best vehicle uh, we have for creating solutions to the common problems that we face as a society. Now, uh, from time to time, I've made this point elsewhere uh, in Wales and in front of Welsh audiences, you occasionally uh, get a look back at you uh, that says, but isn't that a statement of the entirely obvious? Uh, that good government, when it does that job, is the best vehicle we have for doing that good. Uh, and then I feel I have to remind people uh, that since the Thatcher and the Reagan uh, era, uh, we have faced the challenge from their ideological perspective uh, that government is actually part of the problem rather than part uh, of the solution. Uh, government is least when government, government is best when government does least, Mrs. Thatcher used to say. Uh, in other words, that the business of government is to get out of the way. Uh, and by not getting out of the way, government acts as an inhibition to things that could be achieved better elsewhere. And that instinctive hostility uh, to government has permeated uh, so much of our political discourse in the years that have uh, followed. Hostility to regulation as a vehicle for promoting the common good. Hostility to collective action as a way of achieving a common cause. Hostility to services run in the public interest rather than for private profit. Hostility to the redistribution of both income and wealth with the consequences for inequality that I have just set out. Uh, these are the policies that have given us the longest and deepest period of austerity in any of our lives. These are the kinds of policy preferences which I believe paved the road that led directly to the Grenville Tower disaster and to so many other public policy failures uh, as well. Uh, in the 21st century, I believe we must not shy away from 
continuing to make the argument that good government is fundamentally a force for good in society as a whole and in the lives of individuals as well. It is one of the primary political dividing lines of our time and we need to remain alert to the need to put our side of that argument as regularly, as forcefully as those who might believe the opposite. Uh, my second fundamental uh, principle then is that of collective action. The firm belief of socialists that it is by the strength of our common endeavour we achieve more than we achieve alone. Uh, those words may sound familiar to some of you uh, because they are the words written on the back of the Labour Party membership card. Uh, what we understand in the 21st century, however, I believe is that collective action can take many forms. Of course, it remains fundamental to the trade union movement and collective action is most often still uh, conceptualised in that way. But we understand in the 21st century that collective action encompasses as well those particular issue campaigns which motivate so many of our fellow citizens in this last 12 months alone, the rise of a campaign against plastics uh, in our seas. Look back 12 months ago, you'll barely find a mention uh, of that anywhere in a newspaper. Uh, look in the last month and you'll find it uh, many times, and the people's vote, uh, another particular issue campaign motivating people to act collectively in pursuit of a common cause. And then there are those broader campaigns, the Me Too movement uh, as the most obvious uh, current example, which seek to reverse inequalities or create new freedoms in the way we conduct uh, ourselves. None of this is a surprise to us in a Welsh context. Uh, none, of us is, none of this is a surprise uh, to communities in Wales who through collective action uh, have created many of the, uh, the infrastructure uh, of those communities on which people continue to rely uh, today. A 21st century socialism relies, I think, on recapturing that broader sense of how collective action can be turned to creating solutions to the issues we face uh, together. Uh, on the other side of uh, collective action, uh, I think you'll find the third principle, uh, and that for me is of collective ownership. Now, collective ownership uh, is one of those principles which briefly fell out of favour in some parts. Uh, in the first decade uh, of devolution, uh, but is one which I think is now firmly back where it belongs, uh, at the top of the socialist uh, agenda. Uh, I've always been struck throughout my, the whole of my political life uh, at the way that people who have a very great deal themselves in their own ownership are keen to persuade the rest of us that ownership really doesn't matter. Uh, in fact, uh, I think uh, that in Wales there is a deep and remaining understanding that ownership is key to achieving the sorts of collective outcomes to which we can organise ourselves together. And it's because of that understanding that in the early decade of devolution, we refused the blandishments of PFI. Friendless today. Even the Chancellor of the Exchequer couldn't find a good word uh, to say for the private finance uh, initiative. But in those early days of devolution, supported absolutely everywhere else. Uh, and standing out against it uh, was an act of genuine political commitment. Uh, in more recent times, we've taken Cardiff Airport into public ownership. We've seen growing passenger numbers, new routes uh, added. And since uh, October, uh, we've seen it operating at a profit for the first time in eight years. 
at the UK level, uh, the Labour Party's refreshed commitment to bringing key services back under public control has stuck a clear chord with people across the country. I was caught up myself a couple of weeks ago in one of those recurrent issues at Paddington Station where all the lines were down and I stood on Paddington Station for a very long time waiting for a train that might set off for uh, South Wales and one of those relatively rare trains that managed to get into Baddington uh, pulled in. It was packed to the gunnels with people who'd forced themselves uh, onto it, uh, and they were being disgorged after a long and very uncomfortable uh, journey, and there was a BBC journalist uh, on the platform going up trying to do vox pops with people as they came off the train, asking them what their experience uh, had been, and not far from where uh, I was. Uh, a very well-dressed um, lady, I'm sure she would have described herself uh, as, uh, getting on a bit in life. And she bore down on this journalist uh, who put the microphone under her nose. And she stared at the camera and she said, the thing I cannot understand, and this is in very well-modulated uh, tones, far better than I can manage for you, the thing I cannot understand is why they haven't renationalized it. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, if this message has reached uh, into the further depths of the uh, Royal Berkshire, uh, then I think we can see how that idea of collective ownership, so long and fashionable, has become part again of the bedrock of socialism in the 21st uh, century. If Brexit was born, as the research I said earlier suggested, in a dislocation by those who own so very little in their own lives, then a renewed sense of common ownership, the assets we hold together, and the way that those help to create a solidarity society in which a stake in our common future is rekindled, uh, then that idea of common and collective ownership has a real contribution uh, to make. Ownership, I think, then, is intrinsically related to my next uh, fundamental part of a socialist uh, prescription, and that is the idea of citizenship. For many years uh, in this building, I taught the precepts of T.H. Marshall's seminal work on social citizenship. Uh, it will be 70 years next year since the publication of his essay, citizenship and social class. Uh, the arguments set out in that essay, I think, are there and remain true today. For anyone to be regarded as a citizen, and for each one of us to feel that we are a citizen, everyone needs to have a tangible stake in our public institutions and public life. Already back then, in Rodri's uh, speech of 2006, he argued that the future of public services lay in a relationship with the user that was more participative than passive. And in that way, I think 21st century socialism is genuinely different to the way that socialism of 1945 was thought of. In, then, in those days, uh, much as I am a enormous admirer of everything that that 1945 government did. I don't think there's much doubt that the user of a service was thought of by the people who established the great post-beverage public services as, at best, the passive object of the benign concern of the expert uh, public service employee uh, who would carry out their magic uh, in the lives of the people uh, with whom they operated. Uh, today, uh, I think we understand far uh, better, and I'll you know, summarise it in just the word uh, of co-production, uh, we understand far better that we have to redesign the relationship between users and providers of services as one of equal participation, different contributions, but equally valued in the shared endeavour of bringing about improvement in people's lives. 
uh, when I am uh, speaking, as I have many times now, in front of audiences of people who work in the health service, uh, I try and put it to them uh, like this. I say to them that their relationship with a citizen normally goes wrong in the first few words they utter. So when somebody comes through your door uh, as a GP or a practice nurse or whatever it might be, I ask them, what is the first thing that you say? And the first thing most often that they say is they ask the person, what's the matter with you today? And I say that that is exactly the wrong question uh, to ask. That a proper co-productive question ought to be what matters to you today. Because if you can ask the person that you are there to work with what matters to them, then that is much more likely to set you down a path of inquiry with them that will lead to genuinely worthwhile and productive changes uh, in their lives. And I think that is a way in which in the 21st century we understand that idea of citizenship from a socialist uh, perspective in quite a different way. John MacDonald, in setting out Labour's plans for the economy, uh, describes his approach as one of economic democracy, in which workers and users will be put at the heart of the future organisation of, for example, water and power companies. Uh, I think we need a new sense of democratic participation in our existing public services as well because it is by liberating the contribution which users of services make to their co-production that the future of those services will be best uh, secured. Now I've saved the last and most important of the core principles uh, of a 21st century socialism here uh, in Wales to the last in this part of what I have to say, because that I believe to be the pursuit of equality. Unequal societies we know squander talent, depress aspiration and diminish the prospects of the disadvantage. They harm far too many directly and indirectly they harm us all. The aim of a more equal society remains the animating ambition of any socialist and stands of course in sharpest contrast with a picture of the United Kingdom that I set out at the start of this lecture. Now to me, an old-fashioned Marxist uh, in this way, I guess, uh, social class and economic location remain the most significant determinants of a person's chances in life. And that actions to improve economic opportunities remain the most fundamental contribution which can be made to creating a more equal society. It's why during the leadership campaign that I made a commitment to enacting here in Wales Section 1 of the 2010 Equality Act, the socio-economic uh, duty. But today I think we are, quite rightly as well, far more aware that economic prospects have to be viewed as a prism made up of many other lenses gender, sexuality, race, age, disability on the one hand, and cause-based lenses as well. Environmental causes, health causes, peace campaigns, and today, campaigns about our identity as European citizens. Uh, Marshall's social citizenship tax may be 70 years old, uh, but it will soon be 80 years since R.H. Tawney published his seminal text, Equality. In the 21st century, I think we have to work harder to make the case again that greater equality adds to the store of freedom in our society rather than diminishes it. It creates the conditions in which diversity can flourish rather than insisting on a dull uniformity. It produces solidarity in communities because it reminds us that the things which matter to us are the things which matter to our neighbours uh, as well. So there you have good government, collective action, common ownership, co-productive citizenship and equality rooted in diversity. Uh, core socialist principles, I believe, 
for the 21st century. The next question then is how do we apply these principles to the set of circumstances we face here in Wales uh, today? And I'm going to take just a few of the most pressing challenges I think we face and try to draw out ways in which 21st century socialism holds some answers for us here uh, in Wales. Um, in this uh, leadership election, I chose to begin the launch of my policy proposals in North Wales by a set of ideas focused on the economy. But in the 21st century, we need to respond to the changing needs of what we mean by the economy here in Wales. And tonight, I want briefly to say something about the foundational economy, partly in, at least because the fresh thinking which has brought the analysis of the foundation of economy to new prominence has been led by this university and from within this building. So the foundational economy, as many of you uh, will know, is an idea that teaches us that we need a new effort to recognize and develop that large part of economic activity which is devoted to meeting the everyday or mundane, as the literature puts it, needs of Welsh citizens. Unlike many companies in a globalised economy, foundational services tend to remain where they are rooted. And it is need, rather than price or even income, which remains the dominant factor in accessing those services. Foundational services also respond to collective forms of consumption by mobilising different aspects of collective effort. Care services depend upon training, regulation and inspection services, all of which are provided by the public. The roads and railways which take tourists to Welsh destinations are built and funded by public investment. So for a 21st century form of economic policy, we need a balanced economy in which the significance of those collective goods is properly recognised, in which those collective goods are shaped by the strengths possessed by a community rather than a focus on that community's deficits, and in which the production of those goods contributes to environmental as well as economic and social justice because this is work which does not greedily consume the world's resources. Uh, in this election, uh, I've put an emphasis on taking forward the Fair Work Commission and on placing a Social Partnership Act on the statute book here in Wales. I believe that those will help us form the building blocks of an economic policy rooted in Wales as a fair work nation. Uh, I want to turn for a moment, and the only time I will this evening, to a particular public policy challenge, and that's the challenge of housing. If we're looking back a little uh, to the founding moments of contemporary uh, socialism and looking to see how they can be reapplied in today's circumstances, then uh, it's 76 years to this month that Sir William Beveridge launched here in Cardiff at City Hall. Those of you who know this part of your social history will know uh, that the report which led to the founding of the welfare state, Social Insurance and Allied Services, surely one of the most dryly titled of all bestsellers, uh, that that report was launched here in Cardiff. And there is fantastic Pate News film, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, of Beveridge being carried out of City Hall just across uh, the road here. He's been carried shoulder on people's shoulders uh, out of an absolutely recognisable Cardiff uh, City Hall, uh, where he has just launched uh, the blueprint, blueprint for uh, reconstruction uh, after the war uh, was to be over. And of the five giant evils identified in the report, the five giant evils on the road to reconstruction, want, disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness, three and a half, three and a half of those giants 
are now in the hands of the Welsh Government. The elimination of want through a properly functioning social security system, I believe, is still best achieved through action uh, at the UK level, and I'll come back to that uh, in a few moments. The achievement of full employment, so that enforced idleness can be overcome, is a shared responsibility between the actions we take here in Wales and the macroeconomic decisions taken in Westminster. Two of the remaining three, a health service to tackle disease and an education system to promote equality of outcome, have always been represented in successive Welsh government cabinets. It is the final giant, squalor, that has not been afforded the same uh, status. Uh, ever since the dereliction of responsibility for housing under the Thatcher governments, housing has been fighting for its place in the public policy league tables. Uh, I believe that we must make a renewed effort now to restore housing as a top priority in the way that we conduct policy here uh, in Wales. I want to return it uh, to the prominence of an Iron Bevan's term as Minister, as you will remember, for health and housing. And Bevan, of course, placed far more legislation on the statute book in the field of housing than he ever did in the field uh, of health. And it was that great collective effort in the field of housing that led to the creation in the 1950s uh, of those large new uh, villages, towns, green and uh, sustainable communities. Uh, that the Labour Party uh, created. Uh, today, in my constituency surgeries uh, on a Saturday morning, uh, those advice surgeries are dominated by housing issues. Uh, if I were to put on the desk in front of me here a pile which represents the housing issues that people come to see me about and everything else in the other pile, health, education, social security, asylum, immigration, if everything else was in the other pile, housing would be the bigger of uh, the two. The next period of Labour government here in Wales has to push housing up the agenda by having that responsibility discharged by a minister who is a full member of the cabinet. That that fundamental building block of a life from which you can shape a future for yourself and your family in line with the principles that I outlined a short while ago depend crucially on you having a decent place to live. Uh, and the next period of Labour government, I think, has to do more to create that strand in a 21st century socialist agenda uh, for Wales. Uh, on to uh, the third of these uh, areas. I think we now uh, take for granted the radicalism that led to sustainability being written in to the founding legislation of the National Assembly for Wales uh, back there in 1997. Uh, then that was a genuinely uh, radical uh, step. And I don't think that there's much uh, doubt uh, that our predecessors in the uh, era of Marshall uh, and of Tony and of Bevan uh, even were less aware in those days than we are today uh, of our obligations to the planet that we occupy so temporarily uh, in our own lives. Uh, here in Wales, we have the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act to provide a framework for a 21st century socialist approach to our environment. It ensures, it's intended to ensure, that the decisions we make today should not be made at the expense of those who come after us. Uh, you'll be, I'm sure, uh, familiar with that saying uh, that we do not inherit this world 
uh, from those who came before us. We borrow it from those who will come after us. And that's what the Wellbeing of Future Generations uh, Act enshrines, that understanding enshrines uh, in legislation. Now, of course, uh, a 21st century uh, solution has to be found to the finite supply of fossil fuels and the threat of climate change. And here in Wales, we are so fortunate that we have the raw material here in our own magnificent natural resources that will allow Wales to play a part in the next industrial revolution which our nation played in the very first. We have the wind, the waves, the water that will allow us, if we grasp the opportunity, to be at the very forefront of the development of those new technologies that will, across the world, allow us to produce the energy we will need from those resources in an entirely sustainable way. Along the way, of course, we have to continue to take resolute action against those technologies which threaten the environment here uh, in Wales, maintaining, for example, and where necessary, strengthening or ban in fracking here uh, in Wales, as we do everything we can to be good global citizens, reducing our carbon footprint and reducing the share of the world's resources that we take for our use. So for a 21st century socialist, that means growth which works with and not against the world we occupy. But where the damage we do risks being permanent. Environmental growth provides a set of injunctions to us that allow us to go on creating prosperity but in a way that recognises that our planet is in peril today and that we all have a responsibility to act to make it otherwise. I'm coming towards the end, you'll be pleased to know, uh, of this part uh, of what I have to say, but there are two further ways in which I think the application of those basic socialist principles in a 21st uh, century setting are particularly important here uh, in Wales. Uh, the first of those is uh, our constitutional considerations, and they were largely absent from uh, the debates in the first 60 years uh, of the welfare state. Uh, for the founders back there in the 1945 uh, government, the indivisibility of the United Kingdom was largely taken for granted. A 21st century socialism uh, has to be different. Nearly two decades of devolution have demonstrated, I believe, the virtues of making decisions as closely as possible to where they have the greatest uh, impact. Uh, I remain absolutely committed to decisions which affect only Wales being made here in Wales, and I don't think that the devolution journey is over yet. But in a way which separates my sense of socialism for the, from the agenda pursued, for example, uh, by Plaid Cymru uh, in Wales, I do not support the further devolution of the tax and benefit system. For me, the case for the United Kingdom is not something sentimental. It's intensely practical. Uh, it lies in the fact that by being part of a United Kingdom, we are all part of a great insurance system in which each part of the United Kingdom makes its own unique contribution and in which in a 21st century socialist way and very different to the way that things have actually happened uh, in the last decade particularly, we are all able to draw out according to different uh, needs from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, uh, as our gender-specific predecessors would have said. Uh, I believe that is still a fundamental principle uh, for us in the 21st century. Now, a belief that a devolved Wales prospers best in a successful United Kingdom and a United Kingdom 
dedicated to a redistributive agenda comes naturally to a socialist understanding that it is economic opportunity rather than the accident of birth which shapes our life uh, chances. Or to put it another way, that cross-border solidarity is to be preferred to nationalism uh, as a political creed. And if you do believe that, then I think it leads inevitably to a preference for internationalism over nationalism in any 21st century recipe. And coming to the end of what I have to say, I don't think anyone uh, who in his time summed up more powerfully a sense of what it was to be Welsh uh, than the first user uh, of that phrase, uh, Rodri Morgan. But he was a man who, as well as being fluent in Welsh and in English, was a fluent speaker of both French and of German, and who, before he became a member of parliament, headed up the office of the European Union here in Wales, and who ended his career in the National Assembly as chair of its Europe Committee. Uh, the idea that in Wales you can be both Welsh and internationalist uh, links us back not just to 1945, but well before that to the Spanish Civil War and years earlier uh, too. Now, I'm going to end by suggesting to you that a 21st century socialism of the sort that I have described, that if properly applied, would offer us the best bulwark against the sort, the sort of Brexit which threatens to do so much harm to Wales and to the United Kingdom. It would be a bulwark against the horrors of the Leave campaign, with its cries of taking back control from foreigners, its fabricated fears of a United Kingdom overrun by millions of Turkish immigrants, and a wholly fallacious appeal to a new buccaneering Britain. It would be a bulwark against the erosion of our sense of common citizenship, a bulwark against the dissipation of the collective assets which we own as a community and which together we can be put to use to create a future of shared prosperity. A bulwark against the entrenched and deepening inequality which uniquely disfigures our society to the extent that it does on a European stage and which has led to the calamity uh, that we face. In its place, a 21st century socialism offers a future rooted in freedom, diversity, solidarity, and widely distributed prosperity. Each of those qualities requires a more equal society in which to take root. Each one of them is a key ingredient in socialism for any age, but certainly including our own. Each one of them, in combination, is a recipe for a different future in which we recognise in practical action that the well-being of any one of us is bound up in the well-being of us all. And it offers, I believe, a very different future that could be created and shape the outcome of that Brexit uh, referendum, and even in the adverse circumstances which that referendum has created, offers us a roadmap to a very different sort of future. Thank you all very much indeed for listening so patiently to it all. We have about 20, 30 minutes or so for questions or comments uh, on, on, what, on what Mark has said. Please. Um, I the people's vote. Um, the people's vote. And now polls have shown for a long time now that it's a, a popular thing that people want. They realise they were lied to, as you've said. 
How, though, is Labour's policy of uh, the issue being decided by a general election rather than a popular uh, people's vote uh, with an option to remain an alternative? Because Labour's policy, as you yourself said, is to shape Brexit, not to end it. And people surely should be able to have the right to say, no, actually, nothing on Arthur, or likely to be offered, nothing on Arthur, is better than what we had before. You lied. We want to go back to what we had before. So can you the question? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, the question is, how is it an alternative? Yeah, sorry, I thought I made that clear. Take a couple of questions. Please, at the back, thank you. Mr. May I ask uh, where the devolution of justice fits into your vision of 21st century socialism as you've mapped out today? Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Um, I wanted to come back to your uh, the challenge of, of housing that you referred to and the, uh, welcome the strong commitment that you, you made to push housing up the agenda. But I want to as well link it back to an issue you raised earlier in your, um, in your speech about redesigning the relationship between producers and users of services and whether you had anything to say about how in Wales we might think about um, enhancing the voice of tenants, not just social tenants, but private tenants, where I think there are examples in Wales of good local action, but perhaps the voice of tenants has been um, diminished in recent years. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Well, uh, questions of uh, a different order, so I'll, I'll, I'll take them not quite in the order that they were asked. Um, I think I said in uh, buried somewhere in what I had to say, uh, that I didn't think the devolution journey uh, was over. Uh, and for me, the next uh, space into which devolution has to move is the criminal justice uh, system. And obviously, we have uh, Lord Justice Thomas's commission uh, on that to report uh, to us. For what it's worth, without having uh, seen that report, my own view uh, is this. I, I rather depart from uh, those people who argue uh, that for Wales to take on responsibility for uh, criminal justice, that we have to have it all devolved in a single coherent way. And I understand the argument that if you, 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 know, you can't take on justice piecemeal, the argument goes, because the interlocking bits of it are so uh, firmly bolted to one another that you have to take everything in one go. Uh, my problem with that is, is that I think that is very difficult in a practical world uh, to achieve, uh, and it would be a major, major undertaking. So my own view of uh, devolution of criminal justice is that we will be better off beginning by securing the devolution of those aspects of the criminal justice system that sit most uh, adjacent to the responsibilities we already discharge. So if you are a youth justice worker working in uh, a young offenders team, almost everybody around that table will already be working in a devolved service. You will have a housing worker, you will have a health worker, you will have an education uh, worker. These are already all devolved uh, to Wales. And I think devolution of youth justice is the most obvious first place uh, to start. It's at the cusp of devolution already. We just need to push it over the line. Uh, at the same time, now I would want to secure the devolution of the probation service. Uh, and in, in relation to some of the principles that I set out uh, to you earlier, surely, uh, had the probation service been devolved to Wales, we would never have contemplated turning the provision of criminal justice services into something that is pursued for private profit. Uh, it is ethically uh, indefensible, it seems to me, as well as we have seen an enormous uh, practical fiasco. Uh, so the return of the probation service to Wales would allow us uh, to move that service once described as the jewel in the crown of the British criminal justice system, but much tarnished uh, by its recent experience, back into 
uh, that public uh, space. And I think for me, I'd be inclined to say, let's take those two first. Uh, let's demonstrate that we are able to absorb them. Let's show the uh, good work we're able to do. And then let, let's move to the next piece in this jigsaw, which I guess will be policing. Um, and then we'll absorb that, and then we'll go on to the courts and to prison. So that's, for me, uh, understanding there are strong arguments uh, for a different approach. Uh, that would be the way that I would uh, want to do it. Uh, Bob, uh, thank you for um, linking together what I had to say about housing, where I was focusing primarily on the need to improve the supply uh, of decent houses for people to live in uh, with the agenda of co-production that I mentioned uh, elsewhere, because I see Jane, uh, Jane Hutt here uh, in the audience who set up TPAS uh, all those years ago, the tenant participation uh, service here uh, in Wales. And there was a time uh, when we were ahead of the curve in relation to participation in the housing uh, field. And I, I think it's an area absolutely ripe for uh, that co-production uh, agenda where we regard the people who live uh, in the properties that we create as assets uh, to us in the further development of those services, rather than uh, approaching them as people who have got problems that public services uh, are here to solve. And how we manage to do that uh, in the private sector, there are a series of proposals I want to uh, bring forward, have uh, outlined them during the leadership campaign of how we strengthen the rights of tenants uh, in, pub in private housing uh, here uh, in Wales, abolishing the ability to charge fees, abolishing no-fault evictions uh, here uh, in Wales. And I, I think it's a very good point about needing to think again and more creatively about how we give people in that sector uh, a more powerful voice in the way that the housing circumstances they occupy uh, are designed for the future. Uh, let me do the people's vote issue because it's more complicated, uh, I think, than the other two uh, questions. And simply to say that, you know, I, I myself stand uh, four square behind uh, the Keir Starmer uh, set of proposals in this area, which are evolving, as you know, and which have moved significantly over the last uh, 12 months, and I think will move further uh, as we get into the final stages uh, of negotiations with the European uh, Union. And the Labour Party's policy, as you know, is this. The first thing we say to the UK government is they should do a deal that meets the uh, six tests that Labour has set down. And if Mrs May is able to do that, then Labour members of Parliament will vote for that deal in the House of Commons. We don't hold out a great deal of hope that that might happen. If Mrs May returns from the negotiations with a deal that the House of Commons will not endorse, then I absolutely say to you that the right answer is a general election. In any other possible circumstances, could you imagine a government that has failed to discharge the key responsibility with which it has been entrusted and has failed to do so in a way that the House of Commons can uh, support? Uh, in those circumstances, we need a new House of Commons. And I am in favour of resolving Brexit through a general election rather than a people's vote, because I'm afraid that I am less uh, sanguine uh, than the questioner uh, was about the climate of opinion uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, if you come with me uh, to knock doors in the Ely part of my constituency, where people vote Labour, but voted to leave the European Union, you will not detect, I believe, that change of heart that is there in some of the opinion polls. If you ask people there, do they think they made the wrong decision back in 2016, they will not tell you that they, that they did. They voted that way then, and they would vote that way again now. And they are particularly likely to say that to you if they hear the message that uh, I think I could begin to hear articulated in the way that they hear it. And this is, what, this is the point I want to make uh, here. Uh, and I try and make it when I have discussions with people who are absolutely passionate about a people's vote and about reversing the decision uh, that was made. That we have to hear those arguments, not through our ears, not in the way we think we are making them, we have to think about them in the way that they are heard 
by people who took a different view to ourselves. And when we say to them, if we are not careful about the language we used, you were lied to, what they think we are saying to them is, you were stupid. We understood because we heard the same lies and we came to a different conclusion. You heard the lies and you made the wrong decision. Were you stupid? Now, we don't mean to say that. And I'm sure people's vote people never mean to say that. But I can tell you that that is the risk, that it is perceived in that way. So I'm with uh, Keir Starmer on it. I think a uh, general election is the right way to resolve it. If we can't have a general election, then we must have a people's vote. Uh, because at that point, without a House of Commons able to decide it, the decision must go back to people and an option to leave uh, remains on the table as far as a referendum or a preferendum as it would be uh, uh, is concerned. Uh, not with our Mark. I'm wondering, um, what do you see to be the role or what do you consider to be the role of symbolic representation in modern politics? We've heard uh, during the leadership campaign um, with you being described in certainly ageist and sexist terms and possibly some other terms as well as an old white man and we're told that the time of old white men leading us is, is past. What do you think of as the role of having people who look like us plays now in, in modern politics? Uh, Sophie, um, look, um, one of the big pluses of devolution, it has always seemed to me, is that if you look, uh, if you come to the assembly and you look down into the, uh, to the assembly chamber, uh, you are seeing what looks like a pretty close uh, cross-section of what you would see if you were standing on Queen Street. Uh, you will see people in their 70s, you will see people in their 20s. Uh, you will see broadly equal numbers of men uh, and women. You will see black faces as well as white faces. Uh, and that's been one of the fantastic things that devolution uh, has created here in Wales and very, very different still to the experience of going to look uh, in the House of Commons. So that sense of symbolic representation that we have created an institution that manages to reflect the diversity uh, of the Welsh uh, population imperfectly, uh, I think, but you know, to a greater extent than any other form of Welsh Democratic uh, Forum, I think is absolutely to be valued. And I think it is fantastic uh, that we have three candidates in the election who offer a diversity uh, of, uh, of background. But when it comes to casting your vote, the advice that I give people is the advice I've tried to follow uh, in my own uh, life, that when I'm casting a vote, what I'm trying to do is to work out which of the candidates has views that are closest to mine. Uh, I'm not trying to work out if they come from North Wales rather than South Wales, for example. Uh, I don't think those personal characteristics are the things that matter uh, when you are choosing from a properly diverse set uh, of people. What you ought to be asking yourself is, which of these candidates has values and beliefs that most closely reflect my own? It's why I voted for Jeremy Corbyn in 2015. It's why I voted for Diane Abbott uh, in the election uh, before that. Uh, not because I thought in either case that they were likely to win, but because I wanted to cast my vote for a candidate whose views were closest to mine, and because I wanted to be clear in the Labour Party that those views continue to have a significant constituency and needed to be taken seriously. So when I'm on other platforms in front of audiences who will cast a vote in the uh, leadership election, uh, I say to them, you know, this is who I am and this is uh, what I've done, but much more importantly, this is what I stand for. And if you think that what I stand for is what you stand for, then I hope you will vote for me. And if there is a candidate on the platform whose views are closer to yours than mine are, then of course you ought to vote for the other person. But that's how you ought to make the decision, not on you know, those sort of surface uh, things that are important in other ways, but not in that way. Same. 
Uh, thank you, Mark, for a very interesting talk. Um, I want to take you back to the comments you made about nationalisation um, and, and the public services that were brought in then. And someone that can remember way back, I think the crucial things about the nationalisation of the public services that they were given to people of right, so the people had it for right, and it was on an equal basis. Um, we know that that's been snatched away from people o over the years. If we were to pull all that back, um, uh, what would you think the key characteristics of that new model 21st century socialist public service will look like? Because the other one was good, but it felt very paternalistic, at times bureaucratically paternalistic. Thank you, yeah. Um, just a couple of quick questions, really, um, in terms of the economy. I'm wondering, you know, if we're speaking about having a socialist government in Wales, um, how can we kind of begin to speak about economic equality when um, taxation and welfare is controlled by a conservative government in Westminster? And secondly, just in the kind of related, I think the foundation of the economy is great and makes a lot of kind of sense. Um, I'm just wondering if this needs to also be accompanied by changing, I guess, our current kind of economic obsession in Wales with kind of inward investment and, you know, yeah, supporting multinationals. Thank you, Mark. Um, actually, following on from what the previous speaker um, just said then, I'm very pleased to hear of your um, admiration for T.H. Marshall and uh, the concept of the foundational economy as well. Um, I just, if I could quickly get your views on two other pillars of economic policy, which I think could be key to reinvigorating a sense of social citizenship here in Wales. First, that of the circular economy, that way we um, reuse and regenerate resources um, as much as we possibly can and also the um, role, perhaps more radically, um, if not controversially, of a universal basic income as well. Lovely. Thank you very much, uh, indeed. Uh, so the sort of nationalism that I think we are talking about in this uh, century is very well set out by John MacDonald in the way that he has been talking about Labour's plans to take back the railways and the um, the utilities and so on, because he's absolutely clear that this is not a 1945 model uh, that he has in mind. Uh, those of you who know the film, uh, The Spirit of 45, uh, will remember that very uh, powerful bit uh, in it, uh, where there is a film of, I can't remember what his name is, Sir Somebody, definitely, uh, and he's in charge of the steel industry, com the company, uh, in the northeast of England, and he's pictured going in uh, on the day before nationalization to chair the board, and he's pictured going in the day after na nationalization to chair the nationalized board. And he's, you know, it is in some ways, people own it, but lots of things went on uh, the same. And uh, in McDonald's uh, formulation, it will be people who use and work uh, in those services who will become the sort of animating force in them. And, you know, we talk about this in this country as though these were some, some deeply radical uh, ideas. These are the absolute bread and butter ways in which companies in very successful economies elsewhere in the European Union are organised. Uh, in which people who use uh, the products of a firm and the people who work in the firm are there around the board helping to make those uh, decisions. In the Basque country that Kevin and I uh, well, you know a lot more, but I've been to it a little bit. One of the things that the government there have done is they take a 4.6% stake in all the major industries uh, in the Basque country uh, because the government then gets to sit around the table when those decisions are being made and are able to articulate the public interest in the way that those firms develop. As a result, they have patient capital. They have firms that think not about the next uh, week or the next year, but about the next uh, decade. And they have gone from the 
80s, when their GDP was 30% below the European average today to being 30% above the European uh, average. And it is partly to do with using those tools that the public can bring to the way that those firms operate, making long-term decisions, making responsive decisions, while people are confident in knowing that these things that have such a fundamental impact upon their long-term futures, that they lie in their hands rather than in the footloose hands of uh, others. We say, oh, we, don't we, in Wales, we've, we've always had a nationalised railway system here in Wales. It's just that it's the French government that owns it, uh, not, the, not the Welsh government. Um, uh, Owen, um, it's a very good question, which I struggle a bit with, uh, the one about how do we create uh, a fair economy when tax and social security are not in our own hands. But in the end, in the end, I come back to my belief that the most important thing that can happen for uh, Wales in this context is a Labour government at Westminster determined to use the levers that a Labour government at Westminster can use together with what a Labour government in Wales can do to use those levers in order to create a more uh, just, more equal uh, economy. While we're not in that position, that argument is weaker, I understand. But I don't myself believe that the answer is to transfer those responsibilities ever to smaller units, because it, the breakup of the United Kingdom in that way is, uh, I think, a real inhibition to creating the sort of socialist fairness that I am interested uh, in. You're absolutely right that, of course, a focus on the foundational economy does mean a different uh, interest and putting more effort into that than into the traditional Welsh model of uh, attracting inward investment. But the two things are not completely opposed to one another, particularly if you apply the economic contract model uh, that my colleague Ken Skates has been developing in the Welsh government in which when public money is spent on firms that come uh, to Wales, that there are public goods uh, in return for that public investment. Uh, and that if we are providing Welsh public money to support uh, companies, which I think uh, government will want to do, then we should expect that those companies live up to other policy ambitions that we have here in Wales. Why would we provide public money to a company that does not provide uh, recognition for trade unions, for example? Why would we provide public money uh, to large firms that fail to provide an occupational health service uh, to their employees? There are ways in which we can use the levers at our disposal in new ways that help to bridge part of that uh, gap between the foundational economy on the one hand and the way that things have been done uh, up until now. Uh, Alex, the circular economy, I tried to touch on it briefly in what I said in relation to the environment and to the creation of an environmental uh, justice here in Wales in which we understand that our claim on the world's resources is a good deal narrower than we have uh, exercised hitherto. And one of the ways to do that is to make sure that we never uh, draw on new resources when we are able to reuse and recycle and uh, reclaim uh, resources in that circular way. And won't we miss the European Union uh, in this way? Because, you know, the European Union is right at this moment uh, doing really important things to create the circular economy uh, of the future. And UK ministers, even Tory ministers, have been playing uh, an important role in getting uh, that right. And we, uh, you know, all of that will land the other side uh, of our membership unless something very different uh, happens. I could offer you a whole new evening on universal uh, basic uh, income. Uh, so I shan't. My own PhD uh, completed, uh, no, I think while well, I was in, still in Swansea, uh, involved interviewing uh, a group of people who were in their 80s by then. This is in the 1970s and 80s who were members of the Green Shirt Movement for Social Credit. And social credit is a form of basic income. And in the 1930s, they marched about uh, the streets, including here uh, in Cardiff, uh, demanding the social dividend. And the social dividend was a universal basic uh, income for everybody distributing purchasing power because the economy could produce but could not sell, uh, as they say. Now, 
Uh, I think there are tremendous attractions in UBI, but I worry that it is one of those ideas that it is very difficult to get off the page and into practice. You'll know that the Finnish experiment has come to an end. So I was in Helsinki and spoke to people who were involved in it there, and they were very optimistic about it. But the new government uh, in Finland has discontinued that. The Glasgow experiment has not got off the ground uh, in the way that there were hopes 12 months ago uh, that it would. And yet there are examples of basic income uh, around the globe. Alaska has had a uh, universal basic income for more than two decades. So it is not, you know, I think it's a very promising idea in lots of ways, but I'm worried that it is one of those ideas that I can make a lot out of uh, when I'm teaching here uh, and find it more difficult to find a way of persuading people elsewhere to take the leap of faith that they would be to put it. You made a great um, play uh, in your um, speech about, you know, the collective um, and the United Kingdom. But one of the consequences, truly, of Brexit could be the breakup of the United Kingdom. There's every danger that um, Ireland, um, Northern Ireland, will probably eventually have a, a referendum there on unification. Um, certainly, Scotland looks as if it will reach independence within the five years period of your um, office if you're elected. Um, where will Wales stand then? Um, Mark, when it comes to writing the uh, manifesto for the general election, which is, um, of course, a UK one, what would you like to have that reflects uh, the Welsh experience and also the serious challenge uh, of environmental destruction and climate change? No, well, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for your, for your lecture or your presentation. Okay. Um, over the last two years, uh, Carwin Jones, your, I hope that you will win uh, this election. Uh, that I, he will then be your predecessor. So uh, I declare my hand already uh, uh, as, a, as a strong supporter. But I would like to know where you stand on the speech he's made very eloquently and consistently over the last two years with a call for a constitutional convention to create the basis for a federal Britain, um, which would recognize the parity of esteem between the four nations, and would anchor in that a commitment to the principle of economic and social cohesion, the European terminology, which we know as shared solidarity. Where do you stand on that in your notion of the United Kingdom, uh, which you seem to be very anxious to protect? But do, do, we, do we not need a new Britain not a Great Britain, but a New Britain. And second aspect of that is, I'd like to know where you see uh, the applied subsidiarity working out within Wales. In other words, locating decisions effectively at the local level. Why can we not in Wales have what they experimented with in Scotland, a pact with local level? I'm struck still by the failure to come to terms with the relationship of partnership with the local level. What is your concept on that strategically to engage them? This is part surely of good government, good government and good governance in your definition. So I'd like to see that as part of the bridge building to active local and national citizenship within Wales. Wow. Well, uh, some very big questions uh, to end with, uh, if we are ending. Uh, um, I'll, I'll go to Ken's uh, first. Ken, so look, th these are just three first thoughts in answer to your question. Uh, in a general election manifesto, um, for my party, I would definitely look for a commitment to the reform of Barnet. 
uh, sort of funding flows across the United Kingdom on the basis of need, which Barnett clearly does not uh, do. Uh, I would be looking for some uh, commitments on the criminal justice uh, devolution of the sort that I tried to set out in an earlier uh, answer. Uh, and on climate change, um, I think I will be looking for a recognition of the seriousness of the position set out in a recent uh, NRW uh, report about the decline of species and of biodiversity uh, in Wales and other parts, I'm no doubt, of the United Kingdom already. So you'll know from the NRW uh, report and from the work of other environmental uh, groups that in their view, we stand on the cusp here. Uh, we've had an erosion of diversification, biodiversity in the Welsh countryside, which is reversible now with real effort over the next 20 years. But there may come a tipping point where that reverse cannot be uh, brought about. So uh, I, I would look in a Labour manifesto for a genuinely serious commitment uh, to taking that opportunity uh, while it is still there, because it may not be there uh, for very long. Um, Howell's question, look, I'm, I think Carwin's contribution in relation to the constitutional future of the United Kingdom has been outstanding. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, when I go to London, as I do all too regularly, to meet uh, UK ministers and ministers from uh, Scotland on the negotiations to leave the European Union, it is only Wales, it's only us in that room who continuously says that we have to find time in that forum to think about the future of the United Kingdom. Uh, and it's very difficult to get much purchase with the other players around the table. Now, I work very closely with the Scottish uh, minister and, uh, you know, think we we've, we've both uh, got a lot out of our ability to act together on a number of these issues. But in the end, he is a member of the SNP and has a political ambition to leave the United Kingdom. So when I say, as I always do, we've got to find time to think about how the United Kingdom operates better in the future, he's sort of willing to do it for a bit, but then there comes a point in which really he's not going to exhaust political capital on that because you know, he wants out of the United Kingdom, not to make it uh, work better. And United Kingdom ministers, in my experience, are so overwhelmed by Brexit. Uh, they have spent two years since a referendum finding that every stone they turn up has got so many more difficulties and problems lying underneath it than they ever anticipated that they simply cannot find that few moments of headspace that you need to think of something that's not on your doorstep absolutely in the here and now. So they spend their life spinning plates, running from one uh, you know, disastrous moment to another, and I turn up and say, we've got to think of the future, and they think, oh, you know, spare me that. Uh, so we spend, you know, we spend our time to, to roll that stone uh, uphill. I say all the time that the future of the United Kingdom cannot possibly look like the United Kingdom did in 1972, but there are some quite unreconstructed people on the other side of the table who have an entirely grace and favour view of devolution. Uh, you know, we have been granted, that would be the word they would use, we have been granted devolution, uh, and they could happily take it back uh, from us if they felt we weren't behaving in the way that they would like us to. Now, devolution is not like that, it's entrenched, you know, it's entrenched in the British uh, constitution, I believe now, and the principles that I put forward are parity of esteem in the way that uh, you said, but parity of participation uh, as well. Why is it? that the JMC can only ever meet in London? Uh, why is it that only UK ministers are, able to, are ever able to put matters on the agenda? Why is it that only UK ministers are a ever able to produce papers for the JMC? Why is it that the UK government always writes the minutes uh, of these uh, meetings? In parity of participation, these new arrangements based on the Council of Ministers model that would give you a more federal sense of the United Kingdom. By the way, the F word uh, is something that sends our UK ministerial colleagues into many fits of the vapours 
uh, they have clearly been instructed that they are not allowed. Uh, the word uh, federal is never uh, to, pass their, uh, to pass their lips. But in our sense, in the sense that Calvin has set out, that would be a United Kingdom fit for the future with a set of institutional arrangements which would be able to bear the weight of Brexit. Because I think if any report you read, any House of Commons Select Committee report, the House of Lords Constitutional Committee report, they all come to the conclusion the current arrangements simply cannot bear the weight that Brexit has placed uh, on them. And I think genuinely, uh, in a Welsh way, we are trying to lead uh, that. Uh, briefly on your point about subsidiarity, when I look back over the first 20 years uh, of devolution, it seems to me we have spent an awful lot of our time thinking about our relationship with the UK government in the way that we've just uh, set out. And very little uh, of the same level of energy and interest has been invested in shaping our relationship with local government here in Wales. Now, in the very early days of devolution, maybe that was not so uh, surprising because local government in Wales heavily opposed devolution. Let's not forget that in those early days when I used to sit in Rodri's office, uh, the barons of Welsh local government uh, would arrive in his office uh, and they, they, you know, it was a hostile delegation uh, because they, they didn't believe. You know, they thought the devolution was all about taking power away from them rather than drawing power down. Now, I think it's very important. We're in a different era. We've got a different set of local authority uh, leaders and we need to find in the next few years some time and intellectual space to think about that relationship and the subsidiarity principle is a very sensible way of trying to, to shape it. Well, Gareth's uh, question is the most difficult one uh, of the evening and you know, impossible really for me to give you a uh, very sensible answer to it because uh, you're, you very uh, well set out a whole series of what ifs and then asked me to speculate on where would Wales be at the end of it? All your what-ifs are entirely plausible. You know? uh, I think it's perfectly plausible these days to suggest that uh, the north of Ireland will leave the United Kingdom before Scotland. Uh, if there is a hard Brexit and a reinstitution uh, of uh, a border on the island of Ireland, then moderate Protestant opinion, uh, as it is described in the newspapers, who created a majority to remain in the European Union, despite the advice of the DUP, for example, that those people may decide that their future is best shaped by throwing their hand in with a republic, mm -hmm. provided there were strong institutional defences for uh, the, the six counties, a continuation of the Northern Ireland uh, Assembly as it is now, but in a different form and so on. So I don't think it's in any uh, way um, unbelievable that a future of that sort could happen. Uh, Scottish uh, independence? Well, maybe it will. You know, you, you, we'd be foolish to suggest that it couldn't happen, the other side uh, of Brexit, but none of these things are uh, bound to happen. Uh, and in all the many other things that there are to think about, and people have uh, quite rightly raised this evening, that's probably a place uh, that I don't think I've yet uh, gone to work out the answer. Uh, on that, I'm very conscious that the building superintendent answers that shortly. So, uh, is it a pressing short uh, question for which Mark will inevitably have a very short answer? And you'll be very patient. Yeah, just for a while, I thought it was. I'm going to sue you under the Trade of Scriptures Act for the title of Wales and Brexit, but I think you've, in my eyes, you've redeemed yourself in the last 10 minutes or so. Oh, oh. My, my question is, you know, all the stuff tonight um, is predicated on um, us, us doing better economically, um, and many of us f fear a cliff edge in the next few months. Um, my, my question is about strategy, really. You're, you're, you're endorsing the Kiyosama strategy with regard to general election. Well, looking at all the opinion polls, there is every chance we're going to get another hand parliament or Labour will not get a majority. Um, so in that, on that basis, is that the right strategy? Uh, well, of course, I believe it is the right strategy because I believe there would be a Labour government on the other side of, of the general uh, was, election. Was the ever Labour behind so many well, Labour was 20 percentage points behind in the opinion polls in last year's general election on the day that it was called. And Mrs May's only anxiety was where she would find spaces for her uh, vast army of new MPs to sit. Uh, and we know that six weeks later, that was very different. Uh, and I think the outcome of the next general election, it will be fought against the complete collapse 
of the Conservative Party in the House of Commons. You know, an inability of a Prime Minister to get her own party to support the prospectus that she had, been, that she had brought back uh, to them. Uh, and the reason why I am happier to fight the Brexit issue through a general election as my first preference, always saying that the first preference cannot happen, then of course a people's vote would be the next thing we would have to campaign for. But the reason why I, am, I have a preference for a general election is to go back to the people that I mentioned to you uh, when I knock doors in those parts of my constituency where people voted to leave. Uh, ask them whether they would vote for Labour in a general election, and the answer is yes, uh, because they see a vote for Labour as covering a much wider range of things that matter to them in their lives. Brexit is one, but the bedroom tax uh, is another, and a future for their families is another, and that it's that wider prospectus that allows me to feel more optimistic of our chances of winning a general election and fashioning a different future in that way than I, at the moment, feel confident of a people's vote referendum. Now, I may be wrong, and maybe, you know, age is on our side, and uh, underneath the surface, people's uh, views uh, are changing, and we would have to campaign like we didn't campaign at all in the last uh, referendum to get that right uh, result. But I don't think anybody should be naive that that referendum will be the most bitterly contested referendum in our history. And if we thought there were lies told in the last referendum, when the people who told them never believed they were going to win, imagine what they will be like this time. Uh, if you sit on the floor, if you come to the floor of the assembly ever, uh, you'll hear it already. The narrative is there and it's repeated week after week. Brexit would have been a huge success if it wasn't for betrayal at home and intransigence abroad. And if there's a referendum on this, then those of us who stand on the other side will be accused from the very first moment of betrayal, of being an elite who are out to do down the people who took the future of this country into their own hands. And it would all have been wonderful if it wasn't for foreigners and the way that they have acted. And it would be the bitterest and most difficult campaign we've ever fought. I'm not this <laughs> could, could, could you join me in thanking Mark in traditional way? Hello, hello. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.